<laughs> okay. Say when, guys. Go ahead. Are we ready to go? Yep, go for it. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Alex is still on the road someplace. We don't know exactly where. I think the last time, uh, where was he? He was Yugoslavia, uh, Romania, Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Uh, who knows where he is right now? So I'm your host tonight, Eric Holes, and we're not going to go over the schedule, but there's a couple of things we want to do before we get into Conrad Sanders. It's going to tell us all about starting to be an astrophotographer in his later years. I'm sorry, I got to laugh a little bit at that, but uh, we'll, we'll comment on that later. Uh, in the meantime, David Briggs is going to be here next week. And David, you want to give us a, a minute or so on what you're going to discuss? Sure, thanks. Um, uh, my talk is uh, Deconvolution in the Dark which is basically the ability to do deconvolution without actually needing to know anything other than the image. So there's uh, research that, so you don't need to extract the PSF ex uh, explicitly. You actually may not even, you don't really even need stars anymore to do deconvolution. And I'll talk about where a lot of the artifacts come from and uh, how to avoid them in the future. So look forward to seeing you all next week. And I'm sure that's something that we all want to learn a little bit more about. I think we've all, some of us have struggled with deconvolution and if there's a better way to do it, I would, I personally would love to hear about it. And tonight is, today's the last day for something, Rory. You want to let us know what that is? Yeah, what's up everyone? Uh, today's the last day to submit your images to the TAC workshop. So head on over to the astroimagingchannel.org and get your submissions in there. It's Eric's uh, data of the California nebula. So pretty cool um, uh, data set over there. Um, get that into us and we're doing a show in two weeks. It's not a competition, but we're looking for some great uh, images uh, for you guys to present just a little five minute presentation or so on your imaging workflow. That's all I got, thank you. Yeah, anyone that wants to do a short presentation, you know, it doesn't have to be anything dramatically new, but everyone has their own interpretation of data. And we'll give you a few minutes, present what you've done, and uh, I'm sure it would be interesting. And tonight, our presenter is uh, Conrad Sanders, who's had a full computer computer career, I guess it would be, in, in mainframe. mainframe. I think you still do some of that. I but work. later in life, I guess he'll tell us how much later that actually is. He discovered that he wanted to do astro astronomy and astrophotography. And he's going to tell us kind of the evolution of uh, how that came about. And Conrad, the show's yours. Please go ahead. OK, well, thank you for having me on your show. Um, I originally follow the TIC channel. I've been doing it for about a year. Um, I would have never dreamed that I'd be on the show. but the way it happened is I went out to the AIC conference out in San Jose and I met uh, Alex. And I know you guys are looking for speakers and this, this, the schedule was getting pretty thin. And so I decided that I'd like to sh uh, continue to share my story uh, on my journey into this crazy hobby. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting. Okay. Give me just a second here to start the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. You guys see all see this? Um, yeah, looks good. Okay. So I titled this uh this presentation better late than never 
to tackle astronomy. And I initially had a story I wrote for our astronomy club just called Better Late Than Never. And that was a year into my into the hobby. And this is kind of a continuation of where I've come since uh, 2018 um, in this hobby. So that's what the, my story is about. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about what I'm going to be uh, the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about my youth, my education and employment, my other interests. Uh, believe it or not, I do have other interests besides astronomy. Um, what got me interested in astronomy? I want to talk about the local county parks, which play an important part for me um, in imaging, um, aster imaging. And I also want to um, talk about the um, Minnesota Astron Astronomical Society, also known as MAZ, um, my backyard, my astronomy equipment that I use, a few of my astro images, and questions. And feel free at any time to, to stop me if you have any questions along the way. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll just continue on and then the questions will be at the end also. So I spent my youth uh, growing up in Bozeman, Montana and Dickinson, North Dakota. Um, I've always been interested in space. I uh, started the hobby of model rocketry, uh, joining the NASA Association of Rocketry when I was 14 years old. and. Uh, Back then, I was not interested in astronomy um, when I lived in North Dakota, um, probably because I probably couldn't afford it. Um, but it was really unfortunate because I lived only 30 miles from one of the darkest uh, skies in the country, in the Badlands of North Dakota. And back then, probably in the, in the uh, 70s, um, the Bortle probably was a one back there. Um, but uh, since then, there's been a lot of oil exploration in that area. And so there's some flaring going on. So uh, the, the border has probably gone up a little bit maybe to a two. The, the, the oil exploration, what they do is they flare off the excess oil and it has created this uh, a little pocket of, uh, of skies that aren't quite as dark as they used to be. So, um, but I, I can tell you, I was a couple of years ago through Comet Neowise and it's still funny dark. Um, so below I have a couple of pictures of some um, rockets that I built. Um, on the very left hand side is the German V2. Uh, the middle picture is the Mercury Redstone. And then the next one is this uh, scale model of the Saturn V. And these were fun rockets to launch because they had a very, very realistic liftoff from the pad versus a lot of the other rockets I had, they would just fly off so quick. But these these required some very big engines, so the realistic uh, there was just a very realistic um, takeoff on those rockets. So I probably had about 50 rockets at one time um, at the most, and uh, they're just has always been there. My education, um, I graduated from high school in 1976. Um, I went to, then to North Dakota State College, uh, College of Science for computer operations. Um, my first job was working at a mainframe data center in Minot, North Dakota. I moved to Minnesota in 1978 to work for a company called Jostens. And if you've heard of Jostens, they're the, they're the company that make the Super Bowl rings um, every year. And I'm currently employed by a large bank and I'm responsible for networking and cloud computing on the mainframe. And I, I, I put a few images on the right-hand side. Uh, the third image here shows what the data centers used to look like um, back in the late 70s, um, early 80s when I started, where you'd have an entire floor of computer equipment, including the tape drives, the peripheral devices, tape drives, printers, uh, would take up an entire floor. Um, and, and that's how big these IBM mainframes used to be. Well, today, they kind of look like this to the right here. 
Uh, they're just big servers, um, and a lot of the peripheral devices are gone. They're all built into the actual mainframe. I've been doing this for 44 years. I'm 64 years old, and I'm very close to retiring. I think I've been doing it long enough. I've had a very good, very enjoyable career working um, on this type of platform. And and, it's, and now, especially with COVID, um, it's really changed the bank industry. Everybody's doing banking from home. So I'm in a new position where I, I'm uh, a very, very high profile position where we have to, we're doing everything on the mainframe now um, with cloud computing. So it's not just everything like Amazon cloud and, and all that. It's, it's, it's happening on the mainframe. So I had a chance to move into that group. So I, I'm very busy and, and then also trying to squeeze in astronomy. So there's just uh, something's going to have to go. And I think, I think for me, it's, it's, it's going to be retirement soon. So, um, so I currently reside in St. Paul, Minnesota. That's a Twin City suburb. My sky barnel in my backyard is a six. Um, my hobbies include road cycling, mountain biking, cross country, and downhill skiing, hiking, and of course, um, the latest is astronomy. Um, I was getting close to retirement, and I decided that I decided it was I needed time for a new hobby that kept my mind sharp. And being in the computer business, um, you know, working working, my mind is is always busy. So this is just going to be a continuation. Um, uh, much different, but still very interesting to me. Um, I'm currently an active board member uh, on the, at the Minnesota Astronomical Society. And here is a few pictures. Um, in addition to astronomy, um, up here I'm a hiking in Alaska in the mountains. Uh, I love to go to Lake Tahoe to do cross-country skiing. I downhill ski out in Lake Tahoe. Um, this is me and my brother-in-law skiing in a snowstorm in Lake Tahoe. And then I love the North Shore of Minnesota, uh, looking Lake Superior. The skies are phenomenal up there, dark skies. Um, and so that's, that's some of the things I like to do. In the summer, I like to paddleboard, I like to hike, and i avid road biker, cycler. Um, what got me interested in astronomy, uh, I got a Sunday local newspaper on the Pioneer Press, and there is an article in that newspaper um, that's written by a local retired meteorologist called, um, his name is Mike Lynch, who also lives in Egan, where I live. And uh, he was a WCCO radio host. He's an avid astronomer. And uh, one Sunday, I, I open the paper and I start reading his article and I thought, you know what? I went to my wife and I said, I think this is what I want to do in retirement. And so um, per Mike's recommendation, he, uh, he mentioned Star Zona. Uh, there was another uh, small telescope shop, a shop in the northern suburbs uh, called Radio City. Um, I went out and took a look at those telescopes. It was also a, a ham radio. Um, hence the name Radio City, um, and they had a small section of telescopes. But I decided I want I wanted support in the long run, so I went with Star Zona out of Tucson, Arizona, and then I joined the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Um, and I started out doing visual astronomy, and then it was in February in Minnesota, one of the coldest months of the year. And I'd sit outside for hours, shivering from the cold. Um, and, you know, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I, I hadn't even learned this night sky yet, but I was I was really in a hurry to, 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 to get into this hobby. And I thought, well, I can learn the, the sky later. So what I did is I, I sped up time with my alignment. I bought a Celestron Star Sense, which is basically plate solving uh, uh, on, a, on a device in the, on the, the telescope. And it's it's it sped up my alignment quickly, and it was very handy in the winter time. Um, I continued to join as many um, mass special interest presentations as possible to learn more. And uh, this first picture here to the left is, I think it was the first after I got my Celestron telescope from Starzona. Um, 
that we have a we have a patio there at the top and i would i have stairs going down and i would shovel out a little path and i would sit in the backyard just freezing um looking looking at the sky and i'll never forget the first time uh bringing in uh the star sirius um and and wondering what the heck i was looking at looking at a donut and realized that i had to focus the star and then when i when i i focused it uh, i was very impressed how bright sirius was and then on the right hand side um is the same telescope and it shows a little i call it's called a lap dome for my my uh laptop computer and i use that uh i started to use that when i when i started doing electronic assisted astronomy which i will talk about later um it kept my computer nice and dry and for the people that i did um uh visual then it would block out the light from my laptop so it wouldn't bother them And then uh, I, had, I talked about this early that I had published a story in our Gemini newsletter um, about my about my uh, you know getting into this hobby, and that was December of 2018, and I had started in February of 2018. So this was almost a year into the hobby, and um, I wanted to. They were, again they were looking for people to write things, and and uh, so I wrote a little story about. Um, my experience and, and almost that first year um and then uh, down at the bottom there uh, this isn't me but this is a picture of, of of the saturn v when i talked about the model rocketry this actually shows the saturn v being launched and that's what kind of that's how realistic it was um when that rocket would be launched into the sky so i include that picture in the newsletter um also in 2018 the minnesota astronomy, astronomy Astronomical Society um, hosted Elcon from July 14th, July 11th to the 14th, and it was held in uh, Bloomington, Minnesota, um, right outside my, you know, probably 10 minutes from my house. And uh, I was pretty excited about that, that I had barely been in the club, and then um, we were hosting the Elcon. Um, and the highlights were showcase, showcasing our Eagle Lake Observatory. Um, which we have two observatories and classroom facilities. And then uh, also we had uh, field trips for the people that came to the, the uh, you know, the conference to be bussed out to our, our uh, Eagle Lake Observatory at Baylor Regional Park to view uh, some of our state-of-the-art telescopes, including a, an eight-inch TMB refractor uh, on the Friday night. And then telescopes were also set up in the evening um, so people could come around and 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 look at our telescopes. And I, I'll never forget that. It was I was pretty excited about that because I barely into the club and I have all these people stopping by asking me questions about my telescope. So um, I was really overwhelmed um, at the attention that I that I got during that event. Um, I want to talk about the MAS, um, how I got, you know, I, I joined the board. I in 2019, I ran for a board member position. Um, I did not get it, but I was an alternate, and there was a gal that was not able to fulfill her duties in the club, so I was asked if I would be a board member at large, and I gladly accepted that. And then uh, in 2021, I ran, a, I didn't run, I was basically ran unopposed, so I am still currently a board member at large. Um, I became a key holder at our Cherry Grove Observatory, and I eventually joined the Cherry Grove Committee. And we currently have about 673 active members in our club. So, and I've been told that it's probably the largest astronomy clubs in the country. Um, so it's a really good organization. And it, this just shows the current board members. Conrad, you can hide that little stop sharing. Just click the little hide button. Oh, that's right. Yep. Good point. Thank you. Oh. You just closed your presentation. I did? <laughs> yes, you <laughs> clicked the wrong button. Oh, I, I, it says stop sharing on there. OK. No, no, you can hide the hide button. Oh, I see what you're saying. OK, yeah. an option. Try okay, again. Sorry. Let me let me, uh, let me bring this up again. Um, slideshow. 
in. So, from, so from congratulations, you are the 20th person to do that accidentally. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> but there, there is no award. Okay. Um, does it look okay now? You got to share your screen. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, I see it now. You know, you think with um, technology, I'd get this down, but remember, I worked in mainframes, so. <laughs> uh, you're not sharing your screen yet. Okay, I'm going to do it now. Okay. Here it comes. Here it comes. There you go. There you go. Okay, and now, now, okay. Oh, hide, hide is the word. Hide, hide is the word. Okay, hide is the word. Gotcha. There you go. Okay, okay gotcha. So let me, okay, so now do you see my screen? Yes, you're all set. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so here's where I left off. Um, I'm gonna go to the, let's see, I need to begin the slideshow from the, from the current slide. Okay, you already saw this, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk about uh, Dakota County Parks, which is, which, which really, it's really important to me that I have um, these wonderful parks in my area. Um, um, you know, the, the, the nice thing about these parks is they're very open. They're very open and they're over lakes, so you have a very good seeing area. Um, yeah, I'm allowed to scope in the park after hours. Um, the county issued me a permit that allows me to be in, a, be in the park after 10 p.m. And uh, th these two parks, um, the one on the left is is practically right across the road from where I live, and then this one, the next one, White Woods, is uh, a little further away. Um, the first one is Lebanon Hills. This picture up here shows how how open the skies are. Um, it, it's it's just wonderful. Um, there, there's hiking, there's there's uh, skiing in the winter time, and I have this great view of the sky here, and it shows it by you know looking over the water here. Um, this picture down here is is um is kind of a little amphitheater um where i have set my telescope up right here um i there is issues with power right here and i found out um this this past spring that i need to get some different power issues here um i, I tried plugging into like a light post here but my software kept uh not kept crashing it didn't like the amp the amps they're not a fan so i bring a, a 12 volt battery down here now and then this here, this is the actual Lebanon Hills Visitor Center. This shows um, an entrance here, and uh, the the county allows me to to drive my car right through this this little section here, and I can park my uh, set my telescope right on this little uh, this little amphitheater here. And then over to the right, this far is an open field. It shows the visitor center to the right, and you can see a light post right here. In this area, there's just a ton of, of, of uh, very bright lights, light, light the parking lot. So I have to wait for those lights to go off. Um, and, I, and I said 10 p.m. I think I'm wrong with that. I think the lights go off. Oh, it is 11 p.m. Okay, maybe this slide is right. I have 11 p.m. So, you know, in the summer, in the summer, um, you know, it's not so bad. But in the winter, if fall, it's just very frustrating because I have to wait that long. But it's a security issue, and I get that. But I, I'm kind of working with the county so we come up with something. Um, and then this other uh, this other place is called Whitetail Woods, about eight miles from my house. Um, they have this these places called camper cabins. They've added these in the last um, probably two to three years. The skies are more open, and they're darker than Lebanon Hills. And again, there the lights go off at 11 p.m. And down here it shows the camper cabin and. The, they're basically uh, very rustic. There is electricity here, um, and there's bunks in there. You can sleep overnight. The problem is they're so popular you can't get into them. Um, but the next picture in the middle shows the view that I would have um, if I was to image out there. And like I said, I haven't done that yet, but I'm hoping um, this this fall and this winter I, I can utilize that. And then to the far right, um, that is uh, another little amphitheater at Whitetail Woods. And I have a little story I need to tell everybody about here. Um, what happened is um, 
there are two power poles right here. You can see one to the left and the right. And I thought, well, this is a perfect spot um, to set up my telescope. Well, I was, I was imaging Saturn that night. I was just getting a planetary. And around 11.30, I heard this, this loud whooshing noise. I had, I had no clue what the heck was going on. And it turned out to be, I set up, my, I set up in the middle of an automatic sprinkler zone. <laughs> and I had all my expensive telescope equipment here, and I just panicked. And there's one particular sprinkler head that was spraying very directly close to my telescope. Um, and so what I did in a panic is I would go over to that sprinkler head. I tried stepping on it. I turned it. I turned it so it faced in the direction. And then I'd run over before it came around again. I would move the telescope out of the way. And uh, say at least I got soaked. And it was in July, and the mosquitoes were horrible. I got bit up. And it was not a good experience, but I'm going to show you um, that it was all worth it in, a, in, a, in an image down here further of, of the best Saturn image I ever got that night. So uh, lesson learned, the, the park did not tell me that there was automatic sprinklers in this area. Um, my future plans with Dakota County, as I met with a few coordinators to discuss future plans to have a to have a few star parties with the club. Um, I also just dis discussed setting up a future designated scoping area away from the lighted parking lot, um, possible uh, some additional AC power options, and then trying to get those lights turned off a little earlier than 11 p.m. And then I also discussed, this is a very remote possibility of, of maybe having a future observatory that the county would, would put up and then would be available to park residents and we would be able to, our organization would do would be able to do star parties there. Then, um, after doing visual for six months, I decided it was time to move on to deep sky imaging. Um, I restart researching a few devices. One of them was the called the Revolution Imager, um, which retailed for about three hundred dollars. Um, I started doing uh, a, a process called the Electronic Assisted Astronomy, also known as EAA, um, with the Revolution Imager. And, uh, and then I also had found out that the Star Zona down in Tucson had a lens called the Hyperstar. And I was very interested in that because the mount I had was an alt azimuth mount. And I knew that I could take uh, short exposures um, at f1.9. So, and I also wanted to continue to use my scope visually. So it was the best of both worlds. I could still do, do my visual and then, uh, you know, by taking Hyperstar off and then go back to imaging. And then I scheduled a winter trip uh, down to Tucson, um, Arizona to get a demonstration of the Hyperstar. Excuse me just for a second, I'm gonna get a drink here. So as long as we were down there, my daughter and I took a trip down to Tucson. I wanted to get a, a demonstration of, of, this, of the Hyperstar. And so while we were down there, we decided to go to Kitt Peak. And um, it was a wonderful program. I, I thought I had seen the most stars uh, you know, growing up in North Dakota. But uh, this was incredible, um, being up at Kitt Peak and, and uh, attending these programs. And then uh, we were also able to go into other observatories and look through an eyepiece of a very large, large telescope. And, and you can see, like in the middle, in the, uh, the middle picture on the right, there's still remnants of snow. The week before we were there, in late February, they had two feet of snow at Kitt Peak. So um, it was there's still kind of the snow is starting to melt. So um, quite diverse up at that that elevation. And then. Um, after getting a demonstration of the Hyperstar in the Star Zona parking lot, I decided that I wanted to purchase an uh, 8 inch Hyperstar lens. And uh, pretty much Star Zona had worked on, on getting me a, a lens set up over that, that long weekend I was there. And I actually took it home with me on the plane. And then I also purchased a ZWO uncooled planetary camera to work with the Hyperstar. Um, this allowed me to do electronic assisted astronomy and eventually planetary imaging at a reasonable cost. And uh, to the left here, you see the Revolution Imager and 
and uh, you, you can see all the, the cables. And the one problem with this is that living in Minnesota, the cables would get so brittle, it was like they break like unco uncooked spaghetti noodles. And it just didn't work for me. So um, I called call the folks out in California that sell this and they give me they give me a two uh, they give me a hundred dollar credit. Um, so I returned it and then in the middle here is the hyperstar lens and then my first CMOS camera on the right hand side. And then we talked about electronic sister astronomy. That was my start of it. And then uh, I also started using SharpCap Pro um, to be able to do live, live stacking for deep sky, taking very short exposures with my, my alt azimuth mount. And here is my very first image from the Star Zona parking lot um, from Tucson using an alt azimuth mount. And I was very excited about that. Um, Steve at Star Zona helped me uh, produce my, my first image. So I was pretty excited about that. I couldn't wait to uh, get my one hyperstar and come home and try it out. Then I moved into planetary imaging, which was much different than electronic system astronomy. I was taking very large video files to image the planets. Um, where I live in Minnesota, it's very tough to get good scene conditions for planetary. Uh, we have the jet stream right overhead, and it, we're lucky if we get, I don't know, I've never I've never seen any excellent scene conditions here in Minnesota. Last week, I actually got above average, which was pretty cool to do that, and I was out imaging um, some planets. I'm still working on those yet. Um, yeah, it's pretty tough where we live, uh, plus the location, our latitude, you know, we're not very far south, so um, not the best for planets. But this was my, I talked about that incident I had earlier. Um, this is my Saturn image from that night. So uh, I've never got a Saturn this good before. This was not using a Barlow. This was just an 8 inch SDT. And I, I, I still can't reproduce that, um, but I was very happy with the outcome of, of Saturn. And then here's uh, an image of Jupiter using the same size telescope. And then here I took an image of the moon. Um, the field of view with the hyperstar lens allowed me to get the entire moon in there. And then I marked Apollo 11, approximately Apollo 11 landed. Um, to the left, Mars, this was last, well, actually it was, uh, it's been two years now. Uh, Mars is at opposition. Um, I think it was like 60 degrees altitude. It was incredible. The one early, I think the couple of years before, it was a dust storm. I think we didn't get anything. Um, so I was very excited to get this um, from my backyard. Um, it, I, I, I think a Z, uh, uh, 80, ADC, uh, ADC uh, corrector would fix this, this, uh, this bluish tinge around it. Um, but I don't have one of those yet. I'm looking at getting one of that. And then on the right hand side is, uh, is Venus. Okay, after I feeling that I mastered the electronic sister astronomy and planetary, I decided was to move on to deep sky imaging, what everybody else was doing in the club, you know, with subs and, and all that other good stuff. Um, I then purchased a used Celestron CGX equatorial mount. I had lots of help from the imaging, from the MAS imagers. We have quite a few very good imagers in our club. And if it wasn't for them, there's no way I would be where I am today. Um, and then I started out using a product called Astrophotography Tool, APT. Fairly simple to use. And then I also had heard about Celestron's CPWI, which is a joint venture between Celestron and Plane Wave. Um, I was a beta user for that program, and I would report weekly to the developer at Celestron of the bugs I ran into. Um, but it it's, it's, it's works very flawlessly now. And I continue to use that uh, as my ASCOM driver for my telescope. I then moved into using Nina just this past spring. So I'm very new to it. Uh, the reason I did is because at the time um, I wanted to start doing, uh, getting in like to uh, buying an automatic focuser, either a Pegasus focuser or the ZWO. And up until then, I was using a Batnoff mask to do all my you know, checking, you know, you know, the, you know, the spikes to see if I had a good focus. 
Um, but I know that there's a lot of talk about Nina doing that very well. So I thought it was time um, to move on to it. And uh, and then for post processing, I purchased Pix Insight and Star Tools. Uh, I started out with Star Tools because it was reasonable, um, but Pix Insight is just totally blown me away with what you can do with it. Um, so my choice of tool now is Pix Insight for everything. And then I all I, pur I purchased Affinity Photo, um, which forty dollars um, for one time shot cost. Um, but then I nice succumbed to the Photoshop subscription um, because there was just so many more tutorials with using Photoshop. And uh, and then I took training classes on both of those products. And then recently I, I joined Masters of Pix Insight, aka MOP. Uh, and then subscribe to IP4AP, and I attend those, um, most of those sessions as they come across. Then I decided I wanted to start doing something during the day, so I purchased a LUN 60 millimeter solar scope. Um, I did do some white light imaging on my SCT, but I really wanted a dedicated solar scope to bring out the hydrogen alpha. Um, and I found out that my Celestron Evolution Mount does, does a wonderful job of tracking the sun. It did not need any kind of special um, uh, tracker, a sun tracker. Um, I know there's a couple of companies that sell them, but um, my mount follows the sun just fine. And then there is an image of my solar scope on my Celestron Mount. And here's a few shots uh, that I've taken. The one on the left um, was taken with um, our club. We have a uh, club rental. Um, we can we can rent out uh, telescopes, and that was with a Coronado PST um, I had for about a month. And it just happened. I think it's a cool picture because there happened to be a bird that was just going across, and, and I captured it, so it's pretty cool. And then on the right-hand side is a more current version of what I've done um, with the uh, – with the the lunt scope um, showing the, the sunspots and then of course the some of the prominences up here and then i, I want to talk about uh, the club i'm in the minnesota astronomical society um, we have multiple facilities in the mag mass organization um, this picture to the right is one of our places it's called the jj casby observatory and that's me looking at the Mars opposition, um, um, up to one of our domes. And uh, the other observatory that, that, that is my favorite, it's only an hour from my house. Um, it's a Bortle, it's a sky, a Bortle 4 sky. Um, up here to the left here, we have our warming house. And then we have a roll-off roof observatory next to that. And then within that observatory, um, um, we have a star master, uh, uh, Dobsonian 24 inch with the galaxy mirror. Um, and then, uh, the, the picture on the right is me standing next to the plane wave CDK 12.5 and the Takahashi FSQ 130 ED. This mount is no longer used. This picture is older. The new mount is the one right down here that we have. And that's all that's plane wave mount. And then um, we also have in the same observatory, we have a, a Mead LX SCT 216 inch visual scope for the people that like to do visual. And then we have another site that's considered a premier observing site. It's called the Eagle Lake Observatory. It's west of the Twin Cities um, near a town called Young America. And in, in this observatory, that houses an 8-inch TMB design refractor, a Takahashi, Takahashi Mulan 300 Dal Kirkham, and an SV-102 refractor. Um, these telescopes sit on the astrophysics 3600 go-to mount under a 12.5-foot dash dome. And, uh, you know, with this imaging platform, um, we have cameras that allow live images to be displayed on our monitors in the observatory as well into the hotspot classroom we have on site. And then also on this observatory platform, we have a LUNT 152 solar scope. 
And then uh, I had shown this earlier, but this is our JJ Casby Observatory. And in that, we have a 10 inch uh, TMB F9 refractor driven by an astrophysics 3600 um, GTO El Capitan mount. And then we have another site. Uh, you know, it's not really our, so much our site, but it's called the Long Lake Conservation Center. We have agreement with them to be able to use their, 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 their area in northern Minnesota. And this here is a picture of us uh, setting up uh, all the telescopes. Uh, we have a number, number of visual people that come and imagers. We also have a, a good, um, we have a good group that comes in from Green Bay, Wisconsin, that also comes to this, this, uh, this Northern Night Star Festival is what it's called. And then it shows uh, the picture of Milky Way from up there. And then uh, the, this other picture shows a huge Dobsonian. So it's quite an event. In fact, it's coming up in two weeks. I won't be, it won't be attend, I'll be out of the country, but um, I'll, I'll definitely go next year. Okay, so I want to get into my backyard. I contacted uh, a roll-off roof contractor, which you probably, folks have probably heard of. Um, he was from Ohio, and he travels the country, and he builds these roll-off roofs. And so I contacted him. He happened to be in western Wisconsin building a roll-off roof for somebody in, in, in a small town. And I, I, I thought about, you know, maybe about putting a um, – some kind of a shed in our backyard for storage and then to house my astronomy equipment and after i thought about it i decided that i just didn't have enough open sky to justify the cost of getting a, a um a roll-off roof it was just too expensive so i went and I decided to add a tough shed 12 by 16 tough shed that allowed me to house my astronomy equipment and then um, also for storage, then, then added a patio where I could set up my telescope. And here is the shed being built. And then the next photo is the contractors that are going to uh, put in the stem concrete. And then the forms, and then the actual finished product with the shed. And it's, it's really nice. I had to put the patio right up to the, the barn door. So all I have to do is roll out my telescope from those doors. And then I want to get into uh, my winter imaging. Um, it's, 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 we live in a brutal climate in Minnesota, but we have the best skies in the winter here. So um, with Orion and, and everything else, um, it's, it's, it's perfect time to be out, even though it's cold, um, uh, because there's no humidity, there's no haze. And uh, this is our, our little uh, deck off the ho our four season porch. And then I go out and I, I basically shovel the path out here and shovel the snow off here. And then here's another picture of me, a little more, the snow's starting to get pretty deep. Um, we get about 90 inches of snow here on the average, but we can get a lot more than that. I've seen up to 150 inches of snow here on a, on, on a year where it's a, the snow falls way above. So. Conrad? Yeah. Did you think about putting in a pier on that patio? You know, it did cross my mind. Um, I, I think cost was the prohibitive thing. Um, uh, it did cross my mind um, to do that. Um, uh, that would have been a bad thing to do, but I think I was looking at cost pretty much and, and time. Um, but, but good question. Um, that, that would have been great. Um, does anybody else have any questions at all um, before I move on or, or anything coming up? No, but you've, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of positive comments on, uh, on YouTube. So, Oh, good. Great. 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 Thank you. Um, so, so um, I decided to finish off the basement um, in our house. I created an office astronomy room, an office slash astronomy room. Um, and that from here, I can remote into my equipment in, in from this room. Um, and the other thing that changed, again, COVID has changed everything, right? I mean, um, so I work from home full time now. And 
I needed a place that I could I could I could focus on my, on my work and then also astronomy. So this was perfect timing um, with COVID. Um, people were staying home, spending more money on their homes and improving things. You, you saw my backyard. I added the shed and the and the, uh, the stem concrete, and now it was time to to finish the the rest of our basements. And so here's a picture um, of of my workstation. I probably have four or five monitors in there. Two of them are for work, and two of them from astronomy. And then uh, I, I know I got a bed in there, but it, um, that does come in handy. It's a Murphy bed I can fold up. But if if I get to be where it's really late and I don't want to bother my wife, <laughs> I just crash right here on late nights when I'm imaging from inside the house. And then the, here shows my workstations. And then I want to talk about this this incident that happened. Um, we had an awful windstorm of September 2020, which was just last year, and I lost the biggest shade tree of 30 years that went down in my backyard. And I think I went out to the shed. I forgot to lock up the shed, which I lock up every night. And I think the tree was already down, but I didn't see it. So the next morning I went out and I saw it. And I, I just, I was stunned. I thought, I felt like I was in a dream. I um, mean, because I always talked about having the sky open up more in my backyard. And here, you know, my wish was granted. So I had all of a sudden got 40% of my backyard opened up for astrophotography. And here, here shows the tree down. You can see the shed and the patio. Now that tree fell, thank God, the opposite direction of my house, my four season ports. Um, so th that was that was a big loss, but there's part of me that was very excited because this opened up, uh, like I said, the eastern horizon for me, which is where everything comes up. So it was perfect. And then here's a picture of me standing on top of the the roots all exposed. And then um, you know I had this title here called remote imaging. But after listening to Brian Cogdell's presentation, I think it was last week about remote or observatory, I renamed this to called indoor imaging because he's absolutely right. It's not remote imaging if I, I'm going and, and I can get access to my telescope. So I renamed it to indoor imaging. Um, and uh, you know, the Minnesota winters I, I mentioned can be very long and brutal. Um, so what I do is I pull out the scope from the shed and I perform a polar alignment, and then I retreat to the comfort of my astronomy room in the basement. You know, and I've gotten so good at polar alignment, and I know where, um, you know, even before the tree went down, I had access to, to the North Star, which was great. Um, but but uh, um, but having the, having the uh, you know being able to see the the, the, the you know do polar alignment is, is pretty straightforward for me. I use Sharp Cap uh, Pro. Uh, polar alignment, it's it's flawless, and it takes me about five minutes to do a polar alignment. So, um, Eric, I know you mentioned about having a peer, but uh, this works really good for me. It's very quickly. I mean, I could mark something on the on the concrete, but I'm spot on every time. I have a big enough guide scope um, that I just do a polar alignment using that. And then I use a, a product called VNC, which is a freeware product to remote into my laptop, which is running Nina. And then I installed a mesh network to increase my Wi-Fi signal, which allows me to work out of my shed or in my basement. So, so I do sometimes work out of my shed, and I have a, um, a propane heater out there. And of course, I crack the window, and I can choose to work out there, or I can come into my house and do it from the basement. Now I want to talk about remote imaging. And this is truly remote imaging. I joined. A service called Telescope Live allows me to do remote imaging in the winter in places that never be possible, and uh, it also gives me a chance to practice with PixInsight uh, because, I, like I said earlier, Minnesota's winter months can get very long, and there's just times I don't want to go out, um, and uh, this allows me to do it. The nice thing about Telescope Live is I can choose the location of the telescope, plus choose my RGB or broadband filters. And the sub exposure lengths that I want to do. Um, they also they also have a, a, a CAN files that are already you can download. They've already taken, but I choose to do my own um, um, 
my own imaging uh, based on the schedule. And uh, I used the sites uh, in Australia shooting the Etikarian and Nebula. And they also have additional um, t Telescope Live sites in Chile and Spain. The nice thing, the other thing about Telescope Live is nice is that everything is already calibrated. So all I have to do is stack the images. And I like that. It speeds things up. And here, here on the left-hand side is their Takahashi FSQ 1060D uh, Telescope Live uh, Mirror Observatory. And on the right-hand side is an image I took from that telescope. Um, uh, scheduling a schedule, an advanced, it's called an advanced session, um, um, choosing by filters, RGB filters, and that's the Eta Carina on the right-hand side. Uh, here's my equipment that I use. Um, I have a stellar view, 80 millimeter APO refractor. I purchased that last winter from a, a fellow club member. I've always wanted a refractor and I thought it was a perfect time for me to get one. Um, my original Celestron 8 inch uh, Smith Cassegrain. Um, I have a Celestron CPC 1100, which I got for steel used. I was in a park one day and uh, a gentleman came by and told me that he used to do a lot of visual and he wanted to find a new home for his, his CPC 1100. And uh, he, he asked if I was interested in buying it. And I told him, well, I'm not really in the market for one. Um, so I, I said, well, here's my phone, hey, I'll give me your phone number. And then uh, he contacted me again and said, are you still interested? And so I, I ended up getting it. I got the, the CPC 1100 about 12 years old, eyepieces and scope buggy for $500, um, just a bargain. So I call that my planet killer. And that's what I'm kind of using right now to do planets. Um, still working on trying to get the best image. And my, my original evolution mount, my sun, sol, sun lunt solar scope. Star Zona 8 inch Hyperstar, uh, Star Zona uh, Reducer Corrector. I start getting more into galaxy uh, galaxy season now where uh, the Hyperstar is great, but I wanted to get into using, uh, to getting bigger images of the galaxies. And so I've been doing some things and you'll see um, some of my images coming up here where I've done that with the Reducer Corrector. Um, I use a Pegasus PowerBot Advance uh, to reduce the amount of cables, um, dew heaters, um, I have a, the Pegasus Focus Cube, which I have not installed yet, but I plan on putting that on the Stellar View. And the reason I went with the, the Pegasus is because uh, ZWO uh, was hard to get any equipment, and the Pegasus equipment was readily available, so um, I have to put that on my Stellar View. And then my CMOS cameras is a 183 uh, one-shot color, 178 planetary, and then a 174 for solar imaging. And then, then the ZD, ZWO automatic focuser. Um, here are my telescopes. There's my stellar view, um, 80 millimeter refractor. And then here's my Celestron um, SCT from uh, pointing right to part where I get Polaris in my backyard off my patio. And then my CPC 1100 on the scope buggy. And then my LUT solar scope. The software I use is Celestron CPWI, Nina, Stellarium, and I, I've always liked Stellarium. And the nice thing about that with Nina is that there is a plugin available so I can use Stellarium to find. Um, I like the idea of Stellarium because it gives me a nice broad view of the sky. And then I just uh, push a button on Nina and it automatically syncs up the coordinates and, and um, moves them into Nina for me. So. That works out really slick. Um, still have APT, I'm not using it as much, but as a backup, SharpCap Pro for live stacking and polar alignment, Fix Insight, Star Tools, Photoshop, and Affinity Photo. Um, these are two books that, that I, I really like in my library. I, uh, Charles Bracken, he just came up with a Deep Sky Primer, uh, third edition, and it really helped me understand uh, especially how to, how to understand calibration and frames, which was one of the hardest things for me to understand. Um, so that's a very good read. Um, the other book that I purchased, but I'm very excited about, but I haven't started doing landscape astrophotography, but I plan on doing that in my, my future um, ventures. Um, it's written by uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Shaw, who, who's from the Twin Cities and uh, is an expert in landscape photography.
Um, I want to talk about my mem memorable events um, that I that I believe the, are the most for me. Um, Comet Neowise, Comet Leonard, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, the transit of Mercury, multiple lunar eclipses, a Mars opposition to October 2020, and the Comet Leonard, I actually shot that in my backyard at 4 a.m. Um, and it was seven below. It was very cold. And it's not the greatest because you can see my stars are off, but I basically use a baton off mask. And uh, I was in a hurry. I only have an hour to get this. Um, this. Another story about that is I tried using Telescope Live to get this comet because it was so cold here. And I kept missing it, either I had the wrong coordinates or there's something wrong with their telescopes, there was clouds. So I was so excited to get this from my backyard. So it was even better that it worked out that the telescope live stuff didn't work because I got it right, um, you know. Um, so, um, and then the other thing, um, Comet Neowise um, back a few years ago um, in July, um, Comet Neowise from the North Dakota Badlands, I went back there for a trip. Um, and then the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction and I have a little story about that. Uh, another, a friend of mine in the astronomy club, uh, we were so excited about this was in December, is we heard there was an opening of opening the sky about an hour and a half south there where my daughter lives. And so we we drove down to that to a town called Mankato area. And we were just gonna do a visual, but we actually saw the conjunction on that day uh, through our telescope and it was the worst weather. It was cold, it was windy. And it was just, it was so worse. And, and uh, um, but the, good, the, good, the good thing about this is that the next day, this is the day after opposition, is that a sucker hole had opened up around 4 p.m. Um, in the Lebanon Hills Park I mentioned earlier. And I thought, this is perfect. I ran over with my, my evolution mount, and I was able to capture this conjunction um, in just an hour's time frame. And I remember calling my wife, uh, too, to come down and look at this really quick. She looked at it visually, so it was really quite the opportunity to catch this. Um, the other event, uh, transit of Mercury, um, and this was done with my SCT with a white light filter. Um, Mars opposition is still one of the highlights for me. And then a recent thing, a lunar eclipse of May of 2022. And I had a number, number of neighbors over um, I had a couple of telescopes going, and we had kind of a star party in my backyard during that time. I just want to share a few of my images. Um, um, this is taken with a hyperstar, the Horsehead Nebula, um, another hyperstar, Triangulum Galaxy, um, the Rosette Nebula, and the other one here was done with the uh, Bode's Galaxy. That's when I decided I started to wanted to start doing galaxies and getting bigger images um, um, of, of, of that, uh, of the Bode galaxy. M31 just fits, in, it doesn't quite fit in my hyperstar. Um, M42, the Orion Nebula. M13, recent one um, this summer. And then the Pallides, I actually took this picture from our, our, our Cherry Grove Observatory um, of, uh, you know, using our Takahashi. And I was really happy with the nebulosity that I got out of that photo. And then uh, I went out to California and San Jose. Um, I wasn't going to go to this conference, but then um, one of the guys in our astronomy club, uh, we have a Slack channel. and. He was asking if everybody was going to go out to this this conference, and I wasn't going to go. But then I heard that he was going. I thought, well, maybe I'll go because then I'll I'll be there with somebody I know, and uh, that's where I met uh, you know a number of you, Alex and Eric, um, you know from the TIC channel, and uh, really enjoyed looking at all the equipment, meeting the Pegasus folks, um, and. Uh, uh, um, Explore Scientific, I believe, was there. Um, and then I uh, decided I needed another day because it was so beautiful out there. I took a, an extra day and changed my flight and drove down to Big Sur and, 
enjoyed the beautiful California coast. Uh, to me, it's one of the most beautiful areas in the country. Um, this, these are my plans, future outreach. We'll do more outreach when I retire. Um, landscape astrophotography, um, purchasing a DSLR camera. Um, I just finished capturing the entire veil using, using Nina and the mosaic. So uh, I'm going to be trying to figure out how to stitch that together. And I know one of you guys at the TIAC has a video on that, so I'm going to be watching that to learn how to do that with using PixInsight. Um, I'm going to defork my CPC 1100 OTA and add it to my HyperStar. A add a HyperStar to it. I don't have a HyperStar for it yet. Um, retire soon so I can focus on astronomy, um, which is something I'm really looking forward to. And this is the end. Um, thank you for letting me present. Um, I just have a little blurb here at the bottom. I decided at the very, very end here to add a Tempest weather station this summer. And as we all know with, with astronomers, we like keeping track of the weather very closely. And this works really slick, so I have this on my shed. So um, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? I think we're looking over on YouTube. I don't see it right now. Uh, that's great. You can you can stop sharing if you want. Okay. Stop sharing here. Just hit the escape key. Yep, I I'm just gonna uh, you are presenting your okay. No, up in the right. see where it says stop presenting. I see it. I gotcha. I got there it. There you okay. go. All right. Fantastic. Great presentation, yeah. Conrad. That's a, a real fast evolution. Uh, yeah. no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. So um, what kind of targets do you have in mind now? I, uh, hey, Eric, excuse me. We just had a question sure. come in. Uh, oh, Conrad, okay. do you have any tips for transporting equipment? You know, um, I've gotten really spoiled in my backyard. People ask me why in the club, why I don't come out anymore. Um, especially with that tree going down. I'm so spoiled. I do everything from my backyard now. But, you know, transporting, that that's a difficult one, especially when I take my CGX equatorial mount out. It's a lot of stuff. I have a, a, a small SUV and it's packed. And I absolutely, I think everybody agrees, I absolutely hate setting up and taking down. And it is the most difficult thing. But... You know, I really don't have any special containers. I'd like to get like, uh, like for my OTA, get some special containers. Just haven't had a chance. You know, I don't want to spend the money right now. But I take and I use uh, just some plastic bins, and I put foam in there, um, and 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 transport everything that way. So, um, but my vehicle is packed. I haven't taken my CPC 1100 out yet to a remote site, um, because now with the tree gun, I can get plants from my backyard. <laughs> So that, that, that the backyard has totally changed, but but I really do miss um, going out to a lot of our sites, and I I plan on doing more of that. Um, but I, I don't have any really special secrets to uh, to move my equipment. It's just load it up and set it up okay. and go and take it so down. So when you set up in your backyard, you just roll it out and then anchor your three points. Pretty much, I do the polar alignments, and I have a spot on my patio that it's it's burned into my head that I, I'm a polar aligned in five minutes, even less than that sometimes. It's very fast. I used to struggle with polar alignment. Um, I, I just wasn't very good at it, but it, it took practice, practice, practice. And uh, and the other the other thing about doing stuff from my backyard is that a lot of times I get very frustrated. I'd go out to these sites, I'd drive an hour away, and nothing would work. And I felt I drove all this way for nothing. And I come home frustrated and I almost felt like quitting a few times because so frustrated. Um, but I persisted and being able to test all this stuff in my backyard, get very seasoned at it and then go out to a site um, and then feel comfortable with, uh, with what I'm doing. Your experience is exactly like every one of ours. Oh, I'm sure. You, you go out to a site, oh my God, I forgot my Allen wrench. Oh, so you're sitting here, or you you forget something. 
because exactly. you don't do it that often. You do it once in a while, and it's just so backyard imaging or backyard astrophotography is. I don't want to say it's the best, but it's certainly a lot better than hauling out to some place and setting up with questionable weather because you can look at the weather and say, "Hey, I can go out there now. Let's just let's roll out and exactly. have an hour. You're ready to go." Exactly, and I use astrophotic um, like crazy. I mean, I look at the weather really close. And uh, the other nice thing about, you know, I live in a Bortle 6 is that, you know, I do, um, you know, I can use the, the narrow band um, and um, light pollution. I have, I have uh, uh, various light pollution filters and I just got the, the, um, the NBZ filter, which is the equivalent of the LX Extreme, but it doesn't work very good for Hyperstar. But this NBC is incredible. And I got the veil last week. I did a mosaic and I can't wait to put it together, uh, to put the whole veil together. But it was incredible. And the moon was half out and I got unbelievable. There's no question, the problems with the moon um, by using these these filters. So that, that's opened it up for me. It's not a bad time to go out, being able to do that. Do you have a good view of your northern sky? Um, I do. Obviously, I get Polaris. Um, it's not as good as my east. The east is the best exposure because that's where the tree was. Um, the southern, um, somewhat, um, somewhat. You know, if it's high enough, I can get it. Um, the west is probably the, the worst exposure because I have neighbors that have lots of trees that direction. So what I do is I start in the east and then do the meridian flip, and then after meridian flip, probably an hour after, then I, I kind of stop. So. Um, but being that I use the Hyperstar a lot of the time, I don't have to worry about doing exposures, um, you know, you know, set, being out there for hours. I can get you know, good images uh, very quickly with the Hyperstar. So, um, and versus like the Galaxy that I did, um, that was four hours. Four hours for me is like, I never do, I never do four hours of imaging. You know, it's usually an hour or two. But with the reducer and stuff, I, I do, the, uh, I, you know, for the back of the scope, then of course I have to image longer, so. I like the variety. I like to be able to do different types of imaging all the time. Hey, Conrad, a couple other questions for you. Yeah. Toby asks if there's anything that you would do different in your astrophotography journey now that you've uh, kind of been through things a little bit. Um, probably learn the night sky first. Um, I feel like I kind of cheated, um, but but I was I was just so excited to get into this that. You know, I thought I, that can come afterwards. Uh, you know, um, that's probably what I would do, would have done. Spend probably more time doing visual or learning the night sky. And I continue to work on that, and I get better and better. I don't have the the darkest sight sky here to see anything. Um, but um, but yeah, I would say um, spending more time on visual, learning the night sky would be the the top one Great. for me. Great. And Marcia asked if you're using the uh, the high speed F2 filters in Hyperstar. I am. I just mentioned the NBC, the NBC filter, um, which was um, it's called the Extreme. Uh, it's it's the revised version of the the Extreme, which didn't get very 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 good reviews with the Hyperstar. Um, but this NBC uh, UHS filter, which works for Hyperstar. Phenomenal. I did that with the veil, and uh, I don't have the panels stitched together, but just from what I see, it's very impressive. Okay, great. Are we all set? I think that's all the questions that we have, sir. Okay, well, Conrad, thanks very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, we end the program, but you're certainly welcome to kind of stick around and gossip <laughs> after. After yeah, we're like off the air, <laughs> yeah, we call it gossip. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a little so bit. <laughs> is, is there anything else that anyone has to say? Uh, just remind everyone if you have any images to get in on California Nebula, you know, please get them in. Today's the day, or tonight's the night, I guess. Uh, get them in, and if you want to do a short presentation on your processing, you know, just let let us know. Let Rory know. And otherwise, uh, if we're all done, I think we're, we're out of here. All righty. Who's thank you, good night. Molly? Thank you I've for got it. Have good, good night, night everyone. See you all, all next week. Okay.